help if I turn the power button on. All right. Hopefully everybody heard my big mouth, so we're just going to keep going here. This Sunday, the, the slide said you need to be here no later than 10, 15 a.m. If you're, oh, there, there. See, I wasn't reading the sign. Right. Thank you, Eileen. All right. You need to be in Lancaster, Pennsylvania at Sight and Sounds by 10, 15 a.m., no matter how you're getting there. Bicycle, horse, car, you need to be there at 10, 15. So plan accordingly or you'll miss a wonderful show. Okay. Uh, is there anything else that needs to be highlighted? I see there's a fish fry the following, what, Saturday? Is there anything needed for that? We're okay with that? The men are the ones, okay. Okay, we will talk about that next Sunday or the Sunday after. Is there any other announcements that need to be made that are missed that are important for this week? No? All right, let's open in prayer. Father, we thank you for a wonderful, wonderful day you've given us. Lord, we thank you for the beauty of the day. Lord, but we just ask you to calm our hearts. Uh, our minds help us to uh, just slow down so that we can seek you, seek your word. Lord, we pray for pastors who brings the message that you've laid on his heart. Lord, help us to absorb that. Help us to leave here uh, knowing more about you. Lord, help us to glorify you and praise you in everything that we do. Again, Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you that we can come together and, and freely right now as a family and worship you. Again, Lord, we thank you for this day. We ask you to bless this service uh, to uh, all those that attend and it would be a blessing to you. In your name, amen. Good morning, Community Alliance. It's good to be back. Please stand as we begin our worship service. Go B. 
before us. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. You shine in the shadows. You win every battle. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. Almighty fortress, you go before us. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. You shine in the shadows, you win every battle. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. Almighty
The scripture message this morning comes from Mark 1, 35 through 39. Very early in the morning, while it was Jesus got up and left the house and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. Simon and his companions went to look for him, and when they found him, they exclaimed, Everyone is looking for you. Jesus replied, Let us go somewhere else, to the nearby villages, so I can preach there also. That is why I have come. So he traveled throughout Galilee, preaching in their synagogues and driving out demons. Singing, amen? Amen. I want you to just repeat this with me, right? Repeat with me for a moment. Say, glory, glory, glory is the Lord. And then let's bring it one more level, right? Say, worthy, worthy, worthy is Jesus. We gather because of him, amen? It's because of him that we gather. Praise his holy name. Uh, some very quick announcements here. Just... Um, well, congratulations to our nominating committee. Church, thank you for your votes as well. Uh, Sister Amy Lewis, Sister Kay Bieler from the members of the board, Sister Ruth Joy, Brother Pat, and Pastor Al. And uh, thank you for your prayers and for voting these guys in. And these are the ones that are going to be praying with me uh, regarding the next leaders of our church, office leaders. Amen? So thank you all for your faithfulness there. Um, there is a meeting September 11th with the children's workers. It's uh, right after the service, and it will be no more than one hour. So thank you, those of you who work with the kids. Uh, we know Awana is beginning soon. We know school is back, and so these kids need uh, a good role models in their lives. Amen? Talking about role models, that's where Jesus comes in, right? Next Saturday will be our sight and sound event. Amen. We've been looking forward to this. Uh, and so uh, I will be sending an email this week to remind you of time, the time and all that stuff. But uh, thank you for those of you that are coming out. I did want to ask all the young ones if you could stand. I wanted to, all the young ones that are going back to school or who are already in school, right? I want you just to stand. I want to pray for you. Uh, school can be challenging these days, amen? It can be challenging, and I know that the parents care for their children in school, that they not only learn, but that they be a good role model, a good example to others, and of course be protected. So let's pray for these kids. Father, we thank you for these dear children here, God. We thank you for their lives, and we thank you, Father, for their desire to learn and their ability uh, for them to learn. And so we pray a hedge of protection around them, their minds and their hearts, we pray for a spirit of dedication and commitment to, to school. And we pray that uh, you would teach them well and show them well and, and keep them well. Keep them safe and use them for your glory. So we pray for a good year in school this year. We pray for good friends, good relationships, good choices. Uh, we commit them to you. We pray that you'll embrace them with your love and your presence. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you. I wanted to read a text that was sent to me this morning. So um, this is uh, Sister Amy Lewis, who is our treasurer. Uh, she says, good morning, Chris said he let you know we won't be at church today. He's still not feeling well. I'm also a bit under the weather. Please pray for us. And, and I was informed that Pastor Al is not feeling well. As you see, he would be seated here with us, though he's here with us in spirit. So I'm going to ask Brother Al, uh, Sam, if you would please do me a favor and pray for these two requests. Thank you. Thank you, Father. Mm -hmm. Yes, Lord. Mm -hmm. Yes, Jesus. Yes, Lord Jesus. Jesus. 
Yes, Jesus. Amen. 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 Thank you, Brother Sam. <clears throat> well, today is a, is a, it's an awesome day because I mean, we get, we, we get fed spiritually every Sunday, right? Sunday is about spiritual food, right? It should be every day, of course, right? We're in the Word. We're getting fed spiritually. Uh, but today we get a double dosage of getting fed, right? The, I, I mean, the smell is drawing me kitchenward. So just keep me in prayer. So if you see me praying and kind of heading this way, just a few go, go like this and remind me I need to stay here, right? But the food is drawing me. There's a problem with that. We'll have to work on that. But anyway, uh, I want to invite all of you. Today is our food fellowship. We do this at the end of each month usually. And uh, thank you for those who brought foods. We do it to celebrate birthdays and anniversaries as well as any visitors today. So I see we have a few visitors. Michelle is here today with her cousins. I wanted to thank you for coming today and want you to know that you're invited to some good comida, okay? We have some good food today. Uh, pero no coman muy mucho. Leave some for me, okay? Amen. God is good. God is good? Amen. Amen. Okay, so um, I wanted us to uh, view here for a moment. Uh, sometimes I get bored at home and I just look up things, you know. Mike knows what that's all about, you know. So we're praying a lot for Mike. But keep me in prayer too. I look up different things sometimes. And so um, let's look at this for a moment. Lights off, please. No, they're good? Okay. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Nobody notices what I do until I don't do it. There are two sides to every argument, but I don't have time to listen to yours. <laughs> Borrow money from a pessimist, they don't expect it back. He who laughs last thinks slowest. I'm on a 30-day diet. So far, I've lost 15 days. <laughs> Dear Lord, if you can't make me skinny, please make my friends fat. <laughs> I would give up chocolate, but I'm not a quitter. You can agree with me, or you can be wrong. And at my age, it takes longer to rest than to get tired. Eileen said it's so true. So she knows. Amen. Thank you for that. Thank you for those uh, thoughts. I do get bored sometimes and look up things. Mike, we're on the same page, but we're in total different levels, right? <laughs> Mike is there like, if he only knew. Uh, well, God is good. God is good. So, okay, so last week, right, uh, last week we, we brought a message in which uh, I was, I shared that everybody has a hero, right? Everybody has a hero, or at least most people have a hero, right? Someone that they look up to, someone that, someone that, that, that they would like to be like, you know? And, and I was reminded of that when I was on vacation. I went to three professional baseball games, right? And I was watching how uh, the people... Um, looked at their heroes and then these are people that especially younger ones people that they would do anything to be like uh, anything to 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 be if possible 
And, and, and then I asked the question that came to me as I was watching these, the countenance on the face of these people, especially young kids, as they stood in front of their favorite baseball players, their, their heroes, and they gazed into their faces who were standing there right before them signing autographs. The look in their faces said it all. And as I, I saw that, I mentioned this question that came to mind was, uh, what about Jesus? Right? What about Christ? What about um, him? Do, do we get as, ex as excited for Jesus? When we gaze into his holiness, when we see Jesus face to face, do we, do we get as, as excited? Do we, do we want to be like him? Is he someone we want to follow? Is he someone we want to be like? Is, is he our, our hero? Is he our hero? Is he the one we want to look to and, and be like and follow? And then we spoke about two people, right? There was two men in the scriptures last week. We spoke about them, right? And they, they, thought, that, that, <laughs> they thought that they had special privileges, right? They thought that, that uh, because they were uh, of, of the inner group, you know, there was three people that were very, very close to Jesus, and they thought because they were of that inner group that that they were the favorites and would be the favorites or should be the favorites in the kingdom of God. And then Jesus uses that to give a lesson on humility. You remember that? And then from that very, very, and, and he begins with himself, by the way. Jesus begins that lesson on humility with himself as a role model, an example for you and me. And from that very conversation, Jesus confirms to these two who wanted to sit to the left and right of him in heaven, he confirms that he came to serve and he came to surrender. You remember that? And then, and then we learn that in surrendering, Jesus ransomed. Uh, you know, he ransomed. In other words, he paid a debt. He paid a price that was old. He ransomed us. Matthew 20, 28, our memory verse for August. He ransomed us, so he paid a debt that was old for our sins, and in paying that debt, he satisfied the demands of a holy God. Therefore, he redeemed us, or he offers redemption. So we said that, that re redemption doesn't happen without the ransom. The ransom had to be first. It was a price paid. And when that price paid, Jesus reconnected the possibility of reconnecting us back to the Father. And so he offers redemption. And so if last week Jesus uh, taught us about serving and, and surrendering today, and, and there's no way in the world that we can do this. So today he teaches us how to maintain a life of surrender. How can we maintain a life of surrender? And who better to learn from than the best of the best, Jesus. So today he gives us an idea how to maintain that life of surrender. Remember, he came to surrender. And before he did the ultimate surrender, he gives us teachings on how we can maintain that surrender. And so we're going to talk about that this morning. But before we do that, up on the screen you'll see the title of our message. It's the same message as last week, part two, however, a model to follow. Would you please stand with me and join me in prayer? Holy Spirit, this morning we praise you and we thank you that we can gather before your presence and sing songs unto Jesus, and that we can laugh and smile and have a good time, and that we can look forward to fellowshipping after the service. But dear God, in the name of Jesus, Holy Spirit of the Lord, would you quicken our hearts regarding the spiritual food that we need to be nutritioned spiritually so that we can withstand the challenges of a life that throws much at us. And so, Holy Spirit, guide our hearts this morning. We pray that you would bind every and any attempt of the enemy. We pray for the recordings. We pray, O oh God, that you would uh, visit the homes of those whose hearts you're touching. We pray that you would bind the strong men in the name of Jesus and that you would give us the capacity and the, the ability to hear and to receive and to retain your word this morning. And we pray, O oh God, that you would break chains if that need be the case, that you would remove obstacles if that need be the case. 
the case, but above all, Holy Spirit, that you would bring glory to our King Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Thank you. So today we'll look, at, we'll look at five verses, though I trust the Holy Spirit will give more, but we'll look at five verses that give a powerful picture, a powerful picture of how to maintain a life of surrender. And it revolves around no other one than Jesus, okay? He's the role model, amen? He's the one we want to follow. So uh, let's talk about that today. So let's look at this verse that Sister uh, Cindy read. Thank you for reading that today. I want you to notice up on the screen that Jesus prayed. I want you to know, however, that Jesus is, I want you to understand that Jesus is God. We know that. But Jesus also set an example for us, and we're going to talk about that in a little while. He also set an example for us. So he was a praying man. So notice that he prayed in verse 35. It says, very early in the morning, while it was still dark, right, Jesus got up, left the house, and went off to a solitary place where he could pray. Early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. I want you to notice the cost. Notice the cost of his prayer, right? It says it was early in the morning before daylight. Totally inconvenient, right? I mean, who likes to wake up early in the morning when it's still dark out to pray? I mean, how many? All right, there's one, there's, there's one. Thank you, brother. Pray for me, okay? Keep me in prayer. Yeah, that's a good habit. Early in the morning, totally inconvenient. Let me just say this, that, that prayer is not a matter of, of, of personal convenience. It's a matter of self-discipline and sacrifice. That's what it's about. It's a matter of self, self-discipline, sacrifice, seeking the Lord uh, when I need, not just when I need to, but because I need to. And I want you to notice that Jesus also prayed, uh, um, you know, privately. He prayed alone. He prayed, you know, so that he would be undistracted, right? I've mentioned before from this pulpit the importance of having uh, a prayer closet or a prayer chamber where, where, we, where we meet with Jesus, right? Where we, where we look into his holiness and in his face and, and we fellowship with him and, and he speaks to us and we speak to him. That's a, that quiet place where no distractions, no people, just you and Jesus, where he puts his arms on you and encourages you, where you cry together with Jesus. You ever cry together with him? Where you cry with him and you weep together, that you feel his his heart and his hurt and you feel his pain for what is going on in our world or when you laugh with him or you rejoice with him that quiet place Jesus had a quiet place where he met with God and though he calls us to pray corporately and we'll talk about that soon trust me on that but we he calls us to pray corporately but he also calls us to pray privately and it's in those, let me say this really, really careful. Please hear this. It's in those quiet moments with Jesus. It's in the private prayers that he instills within us corporate prayer. Because his heart for the church and his heart for what is going on and for what he wants to do begins to touch our own hearts. And so Jesus prayed. He was a man of prayer. He was a man that sought the face of God. And, and so, so because he was a man of prayer, that means that Jesus depended on God. Right? When, you, when you go see a counselor, you're depending on that counselor, right? When you sit before a counselor, you're at their disposal, right? And you open up your heart, you're vulnerable, and you share. And the more you share, the more that that counselor can help you. And so Jesus, in praying, depended on God. That is, his heart belonged to the Lord, and he allowed God to minister into his keeping. Remember, he's an example for us. And so Jesus was a man of prayer, and in his prayer and his dependency on God, what he does is he quickens our own heart. He quickens us to do the same. He quickens us to seek the face of God and to know that he is faithful and that he is there praying for us. He moves in our hearts to do the same, and we want to do the same thing. Think about this for a moment. Think about this. Jesus, the Son of God, right, um, if, if he saw it necessary to spend adequate time with God before the day began, how much more should we? If the Son of God knew that he, it was important for him to meet with the Father at his, as he started his day, how much more is that for? What a powerful example Jesus left for us. 
What a powerful example. You know, I mentioned uh, last week that how, how when I was first saved, my biggest question was how in the world is Jesus praying when he is God? And I asked all kind of people. My brother was a very spiritual person. Um, um, my friend who's in heaven today, very spiritual, six foot six friend God brought into my life, 86 year old man back then. And no one had the actual answer that made me happy until God opened his word and showed me, my son is showing you how to pray. And so it says in Luke 5, 16, that Jesus often gathered into lonely places and prayed. Often. All the time. It was a habit for Jesus, prayer was. And that you know that Jesus prays for you? That, 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 you know, Jesus prays for you and for me. He prays for us during the storms and the challenges and the conflicts and the difficulties of our life. You know that? He prays for you. In fact, if you're going through something right now, if you're going through a tough time right now, it's no accident that you're here today. It's no accident that you're hearing us virtually. If you're going through something, I want you to know that Jesus is praying for you and pulling for you right now. Romans 8.34 confirms that. Jesus prays for us. He's on our side. He's pushing for us. He knows we can make it. He'll get us there if we just trust him. And then in verses 36 and 37, which Cindy read, uh, we find that Peter, it seems that Simon and the others that were with him are uh, 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 questioning what Jesus did. It, it's like they're, they're, it it's almost seems like they want to correct what he did. You can look at that in verses 36 and 37. And, and they interfere. It's almost like they're interfering. Like they, they knew that there were people coming for healing. And while the people are coming for healing, there is Jesus praying. You know, there's Jesus. This is not the first time that Peter, you know, allows the enemy to put words in his mouth to discourage Jesus from what Jesus knew he needed to do. You remember Matthew 16, right? Also in Mark 8, right? Jesus says to, to the disciples and to Peter, he says, you know, the Son of Man is about to go and, and, and to suffer. For the sins of the world, he's about to go to the cross, and he'll be killed, and then he's going to rise on the third day. And the Bible says in, in, in Matthew that, Jesus, that Peter rebuked Jesus. Wow, imagine that. What do you think about that, Sister Ruth Joy? Peter rebukes the Son of God, and he tells him, No way, Lord, no way. You can't, you, that can't happen, no way. And the Bible says that Jesus turned to him and he rebuked Peter. And he had all the right in the world uh, to rebuke Peter. But nonetheless, that Jesus said to Peter, um, he said, get thee behind me. Anybody know? Get thee behind me, Satan. So Jesus looked beyond the individual standing in front of him. I want you to know that sometimes when people hurt our feelings, we need to learn to look beyond the people. He says, get thee behind me, not Peter, but get thee behind me, Satan. You don't understand the things that have to do with God. And so Peter was good at doing that or allowing the enemy to use him in that area. So they thought that Jesus should be out there healing the people when Jesus knew what he needed to be doing to prepare for the people. And we're good at that, aren't we? I mean, I mean, we're, you know, I mean, like God, I mean, I know, I know, I know God, I know that, that you say in your word that I need to do it this way, but, but God, I think there's a better way. Let, let me explain to you, God, there, there's a better way, God. There's a quicker way to get there. Why start here and go that way? We can just start here and go that way. You see, sometimes God, God, just know that God is always looking ahead. We look at the present, and we determine what to do in the present, but God looks to the future and determines how to do the present in order to make the future happen as he wants it to happen. And so, God, I know I'm not supposed to date a non-believer, but but God, think about this. God, do you think about this one, Lord? That if I date her, maybe, maybe I can point her to Jesus. Oh, God, I know I'm not supposed to do this kind of work, but it's, it's the only way I'm going to make all this money. And, and, and we, like Peter, try to tell God that there's a different way to do it sometimes. I don't know about you, but I've done that before. And so Jesus rebukes Peter. And, and, and so think about that. You know, God is, 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 um, is always one step ahead of you and of me. And if he says, let's do it this way, it's because he knows, though we might think we know. 
So what Peter, what Simon and the others failed to realize is that Jesus was not going to allow the, the pressures of work that had to be done to interfere with his need to be renewed before God. See, he wasn't going to let the work interfere with his prayer life. He was, he, he, in fact, Jesus wanted to renew his strength before God. He wanted to renew his strength and renew his faith. Remember, he's an example to us. In fact, in Acts 10.38, it says that Jesus was anointed by the Holy Spirit to go out and do works and to heal diseases. And so think about that. Not only did he teach us how to pray, but he also depended on the Holy Spirit for power to live the work, to do the work of God. Church, I don't know about you, but um, I have this tendency to, to challenge my car. With gas prices, you need to understand, please, and I am a pastor, so it's not like we make a whole lot of money, but hear this. I mean, I, I, I do this a lot. I know I got to stop because one day I'm going to get hit in the face. But, you know, I, I watch and it's, it's on E. Uh, it's on E. It's almost there. It's a little above the line. I think I can make it another 10 miles before I got to go get gas. And, but church, and we do that. I don't know if you've ever done that, but I do that. And if you've not done it, you think I'm a head case, just you can do this later on. Yeah, get your gas. I stop being cheap. Okay. But anyway, um, but we can't do that in the spiritual realm. We can't run on empty in the spiritual realm. You will be sidetracked. You will be overtaken. The devil will have a field day if you're running on empty. And Jesus made sure that he went and sought the face of God, preparing, being prepared for the ministry and the calling of healing and casting out demons and doing the work of God required prayer. It required strength. It required the Holy Spirit's anointing. And Jesus is praying. And Peter is saying, why are you not out there helping the people? Sometimes we do ministry without prayer, which is one of the reasons why I had to leave the previous church I was at, okay? Because one day I said, you know, God wants us to pray this Friday. We need to get back to prayer. And uh, one of the people told me, no, 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 no. Friday is practice. Friday is rehearsal for worship. It's rehearsal. So in other words, we don't have time to pray. We need to practice When programs take the place of prayer, something is wrong in that church. It's prayer that stimulates, it's prayer that makes ministry happen. And it's it's prayerless ministry that causes nothing to happen in the spiritual realm, but prayerful ministry causes things to happen in the kingdom of God and in his church. And so Jesus was praying. Peter comes against it. Jesus begins to show why he needs to pray, and we'll see that as we go on. And so Jesus um, teaches you and me how to maintain a life of surrender by praying. So he relied on God. How do we live a life of surrender? Rely on God. And Jesus taught us how to do that. Secondly, I want you to notice that he didn't just pray, but he also preached. Jesus preached. Notice verse 38. And Jesus replied, Let us go somewhere else to the nearby villages so I can preach there also. That is why I have come. Excuse me. Jesus knew why he came. Jesus knew why he was here. Jesus knew why God called him. This is why. Let's go preach to the nearby villages, this is why I have come. He had his eyes, Jesus had his eyes focused on the nearby villages. He, listen, he was about the Father's business right from the very beginning. You remember Jesus was 12 years old, right? He's 12 years old. His parents go to Jerusalem, and they go there in order to, um, they, there was a Passover feast. And when the feast is over, Jesus stays in the temple, 12 years old. Anybody here 12 years old? How old are you? 10. How old are you? That, that little cat there, how are you, Kason? How old are you? Nine. Man, you guys are, you, we'll take care of that later. All right. But imagine a 12 years old, so two years older than him, 12 years old, sitting before the leaders in Jerusalem in the temple, listening to what they're saying and asking them questions. Theological questions? Probably. Yeah, doctrinal questions? Probably. Who knows? 
Spiritual questions, almost a definite. And the parents realized about a day later, I don't know about that, but a day later they realized Jesus wasn't with them, their 12-year-old son, where is he? And they go back to the temple and Jesus says to his parents, did you not know that I had to be in the house of my father? He knew his calling. He knew why he was called. He knew what God called him for and why, the purpose behind the calling. And so he was a man that preached. He says, let us go to the nearby villages and preach. He knew why he was here. He was burdened for people. Church, Jesus had an unusual burden for people. Especially people who were lost and empty and had no direction and had no purpose and had no meaning in life. Jesus was burdened for people and he is still burdened today. And church, we don't need to look too very far to realize that, that there is a great need in our world today. There's a need in our world. Not just in our world, but there's, there's a need right here in our own backyard. Not just on the streets of Light Street. And not just, not just uh, on the areas behind our church. And there's a need there, but there's also a need on Main Street. There's also a need for the message of Jesus there by the college and in the college and outside the parameters of the college. There is a need, and Jesus knew about that need. But not only that, there's a need for our neighbors, right? There's a need for those who live across the street from us, who, who live next door to us. There's a need for those in Millville. There's a need for those in Catawissa. And there's a need for those in Berwick. And there's a need for those in Orangeville. And there's a need for those in Danville. There's a need for those in Bloomsburg. There is a need. And Jesus says, let's go to the nearby places and preach. Tell them. Tell them about who I am. There's a need. And, 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 and church, because there's a need, is the reason why Jesus said, as the Father sent me in John 20, 21, so I'm sending you. There's a need. And, 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 and here's the word, right? We, we learned that one of our memory verses is, he, is, is Romans 10, 14. How can, they, how can they hear unless someone tells them? People need to know. People need to know that there is hope, but, but how can they hear unless someone tells them? And I know we've not been all called to preach behind a pulpit. I know that. Um, but we've all been called to tell. We've all been called to share the message of hope. All of us have been called to, to go and bring the message, to tell people we've been told at the start of the year to wait for op uh, door, open door opportunities to, to share with someone. Some of you have told me of wonderful times you've had of praying, praying with someone, right? Praying with someone in a difficult time. Our days are so desperately, uh, prayer is so desperately needed in our days. And people, even people who don't believe in God are asking for prayer. Did you know that? Anything to fix this mess in my life. And so, and so we all have a story. You don't need to, to be a, a, a whiz with the scriptures. None of us is, right? You don't need to master the Greek and the Hebrew. All you need to know is what's he done for you. It doesn't take theology to know what Christ has done for you. It doesn't take theology to, 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 uh, or, or doctrines or deep Bible studying or Bible college for you to know what he's done for you. You know what he's done for you. And that's what he calls us to tell. What's he done for you? We all have a story. We all have a story. What's he done for you? What's he doing for you? Or what has he kept you from? Or how has he met you? It's what's he done for you. I think every one of us in this place can raise their hand and say, I know something he's done for me. Next Sunday, we'll have some time to give testimonies, okay? We'll hear some testimonies from Sight and Sound in the story of David, and we'll hear testimonies here in church next Sunday. But what is your story? What's he done for you? Did you know Jeremiah had a story? Jeremiah in chapter 20 and verse 9, he had a story. But if I say I will not mention his name or speak anymore in his name, his word is in my heart like a burning fire. He says, I'm weary of holding it in. Indeed, I cannot. I have to tell what he's done. Jeremiah is saying, even if, I, even if, if I'm, I'm, I know I'm shy, 
I know I'm afraid to speak in front of people. I know that, but I, I can't hold it in anymore. I can't hold it in. I need to tell someone. Paul had a story. Acts 20, 24, he says, However, I consider my life worth nothing to me. If only I may finish the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus has given me, the task of testifying to the gospel of God's grace. He had a story. He had a story to tell. And all of us do. Listen, all of us have a story. And, and, and you don't need to, to know Scripture Though you should, because we do preach his word here. Amen? One person said amen. Amen, we preach his word here, right? We preach his word, so we all should, we, you know, we're memorizing scripture. We're encouraged to that, right? So we should have a Bible verse that we can write. For God so loved the world that he gave, and he gave for you as well. And this is what he's done for me. This is where he's brought me from. This is what he does when I'm down and out. We all have a story. <clears throat> Let me ask you a question. If, if you knew someone who was dying of a disease for which there was a cure, if you knew someone who was about to die of a disease for which you knew there was a cure, would you tell them? Would you go and tell them that, that, that there is hope in your situation, there is hope, there is a cure for your disease? I want to read to you a story. It's not up in the screen. It's found in Mark chapter 2. Verse, listen to this verse. These verses, Mark 2, 15 through 17. So the very next chapter. While Jesus was having dinner at Levi's house, many tax collectors and sinners were eating with him. Tax collectors were hated by the Jews because they collected land from the people of of God. The Jewish people thought the land belongs to us. We're the people of God. And here they are, the Gentiles, tax collecting, taking money from the Jews to pay to the land, for the land that belonged to God and to the people of God. So they, they hated tax collectors. So many tax collectors and sinners were eating with him and his disciples, for, for there were many who followed Jesus. And then verse 16, when the teachers of the law who were Pharisees saw him eating with sinners and tax collectors. These were the Jews who saw them eating with sinners and tax collectors. They asked his disciples, why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? And Jesus says in verse 17, why? He says, on hearing this, Jesus said to them, please hear this. It is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick he says, I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. So these who question, say, why is he eating with sinners and tax collectors, are claiming we're not sinners. We're righteous. We're not sinners. We're righteous. So Jesus is saying, well, if you don't need me, I'm not talking to you. I didn't come for those who, don't, who feel they don't need me. Jesus says, I came not for the righteous, but I came for the sinners. So I want you to read between the lies for a moment. Listen to what Jesus is saying here. You ready? He's saying this. He says, I am the doctor. I am the doctor. And I came to heal of the disease of sin. I've come to work with sinners, not the righteous. I came to deal with the issue of sin. I came to heal of a disease, a sickness that is destroying so many lives. It separates us from God. He says, I came to heal of that disease. I'm the doctor. And so I ask you this question. If you knew someone who is dying of a terminal illness, of an illness that you yourself used to have at one time, a disease that you experienced at one time and you found the cure in Jesus, would you tell them? Would you tell them about the cure? Would you tell them that there is hope? Would you tell them that they don't need to die of that disease? Would you tell them that the doctor has come? I would. I did with my mom. And I know where she's at. And I did with my dad. And I know where he's at. And during COVID, our nursing home, which we go on the first and third Wednesday of the month, um, we had some good times there. 
Some of you led some of them to Christ. Sister K, Sister Ann, God felt the, um, they're not here anymore. Brother, uh, Brother Caleb, we saw one man. You remember that day as he wept before God. The last moments of his life. I know where they're at. I went back to the nursing home after the pandemic, and, and they, I didn't see these faces anymore. Bob was another one. Where were they? Um, they passed away during COVID. I know where they're at because they received the healing from the disease that is taking so many lives today. Would you tell them? How about a family member? Would you tell them that there's a cure for the disease? We give out the little cards, right? Um, come join us cards. I'll be giving out some next week again. Those are moments, they're opportunities for people to hear the message of Jesus. That you know that there's a high percentage of people who come to Christ because they've inv been invited to church. Inviting people to church is so important. So we give out that. We have in the back, we have little gospel tracts. Car carry them in your wallet, carry them in your purses. Give them out to people. Those are opportunities to tell them about the one who came to cure of a disease that is killing so many lives. And so he came, and he was a man of prayer. Jesus prayed. Jesus preached. He shared the message. He says, let us go to the nearby towns. That's why I have come. Why has he called you? We're not all preachers, but we're all tellers, and we've all been called to share with others. <clears throat> and notice, lastly, that he didn't just come to pray. He didn't just pray. He didn't just preach, but he also, up on the screen, he practiced. Jesus practiced. Verse 39. So he traveled throughout Galilee, preaching in their synagogues and driving out demons. He traveled throughout Galilee. He said, let's go to the nearby places. He traveled throughout Galilee, preaching in their synagogues and driving out demons. Think about this. Jesus is going from synagogue to synagogue throughout Galilee, and he's declaring, he's, he's, he's preaching, and he's healing. Think about that for a moment. Jesus is combining preaching and practicing together, and those two always go together. See, when he preached, he did the will of God in word, and when he practiced, he did, did the will of God in works how he lived, his life. Jesus' life exemplified, it, it, it exemplified, it cooperated with the message that he was preaching. See, Jesus didn't just talk the walk. He walked the talk that he talked. His word, his words combined with his life, and his life connected with his words. He didn't just preach but he also practiced. For the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. He came to preach and he came to practice. By the way, his preaching was part of his practice. Did you know that? That we, 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 all of us are preaching God's word in one way or another. See, you know, I... The gospel is not just preached in word. It's not just preached by what we say. The gospel is preached by what we do. The gospel is preached by how we live. When people see a person that is filled with the Spirit of the Lord, they know there's something different about him. He just acts different. He just talks different. He just, he just um, responds different. He just, she is just different. Why? Because... The God of the universe lives inside of their hearts. And so he's the one that speaks through and does through. So we're all preaching a message. You know that? Every one of us is preaching a message on a day-to-day -day basis by how we live. The question is, what kind of message are you preaching? And does that message connect with the life that you're living? Jesus preached, but he also practiced, and those two go together. And when we practice, we're also preaching his word. So I remember um, 
I mentioned this before, but this was some years ago, and so not all of you were here, so I'm going to say it again. If you heard it before, maybe God wants you to hear it again. But if you haven't, please hear this. I was standing at a, uh, on a bank line many, many years ago in our first church uh, that I was a pastor there, and I was standing on the line to, um, in the bank there to see the teller and to make a deposit of Sunday's, uh, Sunday's uh, offerings. And I'm standing there, and there's like four or five people in front of me, and there's a girl at the teller line, She's there talking to the teller, and all of a sudden, um, you know, a bank is usually nice and quiet, right? Little private conversations, counseling, and all that stuff, you know, uh, regarding money, finances, and stuff like that. This girl begins to yell out loud, New York City, 106th Street, Lexington Avenue, <clears throat> bank in the corner, starts yelling out loud and yelling and, and cursing. And I, 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 don't even, I don't even want to think of the words that she was saying. I rebuked those, even the words that she was saying. But she just started cursing out loud in the bank right there in front of everyone. And um, people were afraid. Some were backing up. You know, the, the teller is turning different colors. And she's knocking her and, you know, saying bad things about her. You don't know what you're doing. You know, how dare you handle my money? You don't even know how to count and, and stuff like that. And then she says, you know, I want to, and I'm not, I'm leaving out the words. Okay, you okay with that? I'm leaving out the word. Beep, beep, beep. Okay, so I'm leaving out the words. So, and then suddenly she says, I want to see the bank. I want to see the manager. I don't want to talk with you. I want to see the manager, you know, angry, you know, and, um, the manager comes and stands alongside her, and she's jumping out her bag and screaming at her, you know, how dare you hire someone like this? Don't even know how my little daughter knows how to count better, stuff like that. And the manager proceeds to calm this woman and, and, and gives her what she wants, whether it was more money or whatever it was. I don't remember what it was, but she gave her what she, she's satisfied. And this lady, her countenance changed, and, and she was at peace. And she said, I praise God my Savior. Uh, you know, God always looks out for me. This is this woman who is just someone else. God always looks out for me. He's always faithful. He's my provider. He looks out for my back. And church, that, it hurt me so much to hear that. What kind of a testimony was that to those in that church who were rejecting God? How much reason that gave them to say, that's why I don't go to church. If church makes people like that, I don't need to be in church. And if I wasn't a Christian that day, if I didn't know Jesus, I would have agreed with that, that same philosophy of life. We have to watch the life we live because the life we live is a message in itself. Jesus didn't just pray and he didn't just preach, but he also practiced. I wanted to read this to you. Charles Spurgeon, the late Charles Spurgeon, uh, was known as the father of preachers. So he was a great, great preacher. I want to read to you uh, what he said. He said, a person's life is always more forcible than his speech. A person's life is always more forcible than his speech. It stands out more. When people take stock of him, they reckon his deeds as dollars and his words as pennies. If his life and doctrine disagree, the mass of onlookers accept his practice, but they reject his preaching. You see, the average person in that bank would accept her lifestyle, but they would reject her preaching. My God provides my needs. They would reject that. That's garbage. Her lifestyle, they understand. They accept that. It's the world we're living in. God is calling for men and women that are totally committed, surrendered to him, and maintaining that surrender to him by living a life of prayer, a life that shares the message that is, I'm so in tune with him that I need to share him with them. And that practice is that. It's all because of prayer. If you and I have an intimate time with God consistently, we're praying, our minds are on him, and we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna say the right things, and we're going to do the right things. If we don't have that prayer life, that's why Jesus is, says it's, he started by, by prayer. 
So someone said it like this, don't, don't merely claim to be a Christian, aim to live like one. Aim to live like one. So Jesus is a powerful, powerful role model, right? Jesus um, maintained, right? He maintained, remember again, he is an example for us. He maintained a surrendered life as an example for us by praying and preaching and practicing. Again, remember, he is our example, right? John 13, 15, I have set you an example that you should do as I've done for you. I have set you an example. 1 Peter 2, 21 says that, that he left us an example so that we would follow in his footsteps. 1 John 2, 6, the last part of it says that if anyone claims to live in Christ, he must walk as Jesus did. The word walk in the Greek is the same word for live. Anyone who claims to be in him must live as Jesus lived. He was an example for us. For an example for you and for me. So he maintained his life of surrender, and so can we. Notice up on the screen. <clears throat> he prayed, he preached, he practiced, right? He prayed, he preached, he practiced. And when, 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 when Jesus prayed, he depended on God, right? When he preached, he shared God. And when he practiced, he followed God. That was the example he leads for us. He surrendered, he served, and maintained that surrender by praying, preaching, and practicing. But we can do the same. We'll close with these thoughts. Notice the next slide. <clears throat> Three things we need to do. Three B's. I call them the three B's for application. Number one on your bullets and way in the bottom. Be born again. Be born again. We need to be born again. Jesus says in John 3, unless a man or woman is born again, they will not see the kingdom of God. Unless if a person is, is born again, he will not experience the things of God. Unless a person is born again, he will not understand what prayer is all about. Unless a person is born again, he will not experience the things of God. You must be born again. We were born wrong the first day, we, the first time. We know that, right? The Bible says we were, we were born the wrong way. So we need to be born again, and that's born of Christ, Christ coming into our hearts and changing our lives, ransoming us before God so that we're redeemed. And when we're redeemed, we're reconnected with God, and we're, when we're reconnected with God, we can live that kind of life of surrender. Be born again. Secondly, be daily in the Word. Be about His book most important book in all the world the only book that transforms life every other book informs this one transforms it changes lives be in the book daily right jesus says in john 8 he says if you continue in my word then are you my disciples indeed verses 32 and 33a so if we continue in his word so be daily in the word being in his word is reading a love letter that reminds me of someone who loves me, gave his life for me, and also guides and directs my life and how I live. Be in his word. Listen to his voice. Listen to what he has to say. God speaks to us in so many different ways, but all that speaking always connects with his word. He never, he never comes against his word. And lastly, be about Jesus. Follow Christ. Be about Jesus. You know, let Jesus be the center of your life. We'll talk one day about obsessions very soon, okay? But be obsessed with Jesus. Remember that. Remember that thought. Be obsessed with Jesus. Be about Jesus. Follow him. Let him be the guide that you take. He's a lamp to our feet, a light to our path. Let him be the guide. Let him be the direction you take. Don't go left or right if he says keep going straight. He knows where to get you, and he knows how you're going to get there. He's faithful to his word. You see, the devil has done a fairly good job, to say the least, in convincing people that they could never attain to be the kind of person that God wants them to be and wants them to experience. But this message reminds us that that is not true. This message tells us otherwise, that through Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the Son of God, who taught us how to pray and practice and preach, that through him we can attain a life of surrender and connection, horizontal, conne vertical connection with God, vertical connection with God through a life of surrender. He taught us how to do it. We can do it through Christ. Amen?
Amen. So I want to take a moment to pray. I want to ask you this. This is a very, very honest question, okay? Really, really honest. I want to ask you, is Jesus your Savior and Lord? Is he your hero? Is he the one you want to follow? Our world is filled with empty promises that are made today and broken tomorrow. Empty promises. They're like, like bubbles, you know. They look like they're full, but they're really empty. Our world is filled with empty bubbles and empty promises. Do you have Jesus who keeps his word and is faithful, came and gave his life for you? Is he your Savior and Lord? Is he someone you're following? And if he is, what's your prayer life like? Do you follow him into the prayer chamber every day? Do you spend adequate time with Jesus? Now, it, 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 if you need to stand for that, for prayer, just stand. If you need, yeah, I need prayer for that, Pastor. I need to pray. I need to pray better. I need to pray more. I don't, I don't meet enough with Jesus. Listen, the most important person you can spend time with on a given day is Jesus. I mean, we spend time with our spouses and with our children and with our family and with our friends and with our fellow workers, and that's all good. But if we're spending more time with people than we are with Jesus, there is a problem. It's Jesus who changes the individual person and who ministers into the individual hearts. So what's your prayer life? Secondly, um, are you sharing his word? I know every hand would go up and say, yeah, I, I know someone who, who is not experiencing the life of Jesus. Every hand would go up. I know that. So we already have people like that. Are you sharing with them the message of hope? Is your life connecting with your commitment? And lastly, <clears throat> are you practicing? Is your life an example to those? If you were accused of being a Christian in your job, would there be sufficient evidence to prove it? Would they know you're a child of God by how you live and how you conduct yourselves and how you carry yourself at your work site? If you know you need prayer for any of those, please stand. If you need prayer, Holy Spirit of God, I pray for these people before me right now. I pray for those at home, Spirit of the Lord, in the name of Jesus, you came to change. You know everything going on in the inside. You know every spot, every blemish. You know everything. You see what we don't see sometimes. Would you reveal to us today what we need to see and hear, God, in the name of Jesus? If you're here today seated, if you're at home hearing this word, please give us a call. 570-784-6161. Give us a call. If this is your moment to say, I've never received Jesus as my Savior and my Lord. I've never invited him in. I've heard about him. I know about him. But I've never said, Jesus, be my Savior. Be my example. Be my role model. I want to follow you. If you've never done that, please stand. You've never done that. You want to do it today for the first time, please stand. Let's make it right with Jesus. Let's make it right with the Savior. Amen? He came to save lives, to ransom a pay, a payment that was due on your behalf, and to connect you with God. If you've never done that, please stand. I want to pray with you. I want to pray with you. If you have friends you know you need to be praying for, friends you need to know, family members that you need to, to tell them about Jesus, it starts with prayer, church. If we're not praying for them and just telling them, it doesn't work. It starts with praying for them. If you hear it, then you would say, there's someone at my job that I know that, that if he died today, he'd go to an eternity without God. There's someone at your job that you know God's called you to share with. If there's a neighbor, church, this is him, okay? This is Jesus. This is the Holy Spirit. If there's a neighbor in your community that you know God's given you opportunity to tell, to tell and you haven't, I, I want you to stand. I want to pray with you. God's burdened for your neighbor. He, he's burdened for him. You know that? He loves your neighbors, church. If there's a neighbor that you know that you need to tell at work in your community, a family member that you need to tell them what Jesus has done for you and how he, he heals of a disease that kills and separates from God, just stand. Would you that? Would you do that? And if you know that your life at work doesn't look like it's supposed to as God wants it to, or you've not been a good example to your spouse or your children or your neighbors or your friends, you've not been a good testimony by the things you say and the things you do, would you please stand? God wants to change that in you, my sister. He wants to change that in you, my brother. He wants to change that in us. 
so that our lives would be a role model that follows Jesus. And when we're like Jesus, lives are changed. I stand with you. And those of you that are seated, if, would you pray for us that are standing? Because if you're praying, and if you're preaching, and if you're practicing, I praise God for you. But we need to do it more here that are standing. Would you pray for us? And if you know you need to be standing, call the devil a liar and stand in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, I rebuke every trap of the devil that would keep us from taking a step forward for Jesus. In the name of Jesus, I come against you, Father of lies. And I declare the people of God the people of God. And I declare freedom from captivity. I, I declare a breakthrough in the name of Jesus. And I pray today, O oh God, that Holy Spirit, you would have your way in the life, that life, that life, that life, and also that one in the name of Jesus. And that the decision would be made today for Christ to pray more, to seek your face, to depend on you and not on myself to preach, to share, to tell the message of Jesus to those that I know that, that when they pass on, they'll be lost from Jesus. To just tell them whether they receive it or not, you call us to tell them. And to live a life at work that would tell everyone about around me that I'm a child of God. I don't do those things because I'm a child of God. My eyes are on Jesus. Lord, we can't stop doing things that we do, but through you we can and so I pray for these standing in the name of Jesus. I commit them to you, Father. Thank you. Uh, thank you for those that are standing. And I pray, for, I pray for them. I pray that you would put your hand upon them. I pray, oh God, that even right now, you who know their hearts, that you would quicken them regarding Jesus. I pray, Holy Spirit, that right now you would open their eyes and that they would see spiritually, that they would see standing beside them Jesus. Nails, God, hands, and all, that they would see Jesus in his love and mercy, embracing, touching, and comforting, and loving them, and remind them then that everything is going to be okay. Everything's going to be fine. Just follow me, my son. Follow me, my daughter. Follow me. I know the road you're to take. I know the road you're on. I know how to get you on track. Trust me. Trust my word. I want to spend time with you. I want to share with you my heart. I want to remove the pain and the struggles and the challenges. I want to answer the questions. I want to provide warmth and challenge. I want to plant my word in your heart. I will preach through you. The Holy Spirit will preach the word through you. He'll tell your friend. He'll tell your neighbor. He'll tell your enemy. He'll tell them, trust me. I'll help you say no to the sins. I'll help you say no to the challenges. Just keep your eyes on me. Holy Spirit, we thank you and praise you for your grace and love. Thank you for, thank you for Jesus. I pray for these, encourage them. And Lord, I pray that you'd put your arms on them. I pray that you'd embrace them. I pray that they would know you. I pray that, that you would give them hunger and thirst for your word. I pray that you would revive their prayer time. I pray for that place in their home which you will show, that place in their home where they will bow before you and, and receive blessing and compassion and encouragement and strength and power to keep going on in the name of Jesus. I pray for that spot. I pray for that person that, that they're standing up for right now. I pray for that friend at work. I pray for that family member. I pray for that neighbor. Oh, God, who is lost, lost from Jesus. I pray for that person that you prepare their hearts, oh, God, and that you would prepare your people to bring forth a message of the story they have to tell. And I commit their lives, their followership of Jesus to you as well. Thank you and bless you. In Jesus' name, amen. Please, st please stand as we sing our closing song.
We know that the Bible says that Jesus is not just Savior, but He's Comforter. He sent the Holy Spirit to comfort and to encourage and, and, and to meet us where we're at. I, um, I just want you to know this song was so appropriate. Thank you, uh, Brother Rod and Cindy, Sister Cindy. Just, um, I, I just want you to know the altar is open. If you need prayer, anybody needs prayer, the altar is open. There are prayer booths where we can pray. You want to meet along with God and just talk to him about something he said to you. The altar is open. We're going to get ready for our food fellowship. We'll pray in a moment. But more important than that food is this food. It's a spiritual food. So if Jesus wants to feed you with something more today, something he said to your heart, you need prayer, or you want to talk at the altar, I want you to know that, that the altar is open. Amen? Let's pray. Father, thank you for your grace and love. Thank you again, Jesus, for you. Thank you for you. Jesus, you will never stop being who you are. You were who you are yesterday, and you are who you are today, and you will be that tomorrow. So your love is always consistent. It doesn't stop. Your mercy doesn't stop. Your grace, your love, your presence, your promise never stops. It's who you are. And I pray that you would silence our ears to any voice that says otherwise in the name of Jesus. And Lord, I pray for us that you would guide us and direct us through this week and use us and remind us, Jesus, help us to see you praying and preaching and practicing that life of God as we pursue a life of surrender for Christ in these days. There's calling for that. Father, thank you for those that have worked so hard to prepare this food. Thank you for providing it. Thank you for those who are celebrating birthdays in the month of August. I pray that you'd embrace them as well. And the anniversaries, Lord, would you embrace them and bless them and encourage them? And Father, we pray that you would bless our food and our fellowship. We invite you, sit, uh, dear Jesus, to be sitting at the center of our conversations. We gather because of you. Thank you for the family of God. Thank you for brothers and sisters in Christ. Thank you for those you brought into our church today. Would you embrace them with your love today? We bless you and we praise you in Jesus' name. And all the people together say, Amen. Thank you.